Tonight on Philly Cam Voices, a look at the race to vaccinate Philadelphians and why some fear getting the shot. Plus, how Kate Mobile Response Unit is administering COVID tests in the city. And the owner of a South Philadelphia restaurant talks about reopening after the city eases COVID-19 restrictions on indoor dining. Good evening. Thank you for tuning in to Philly Cam Voices. I'm your host, Amanda Johnson. The Kate Mobile Response Unit has made several stops in Philadelphia to administer COVID-19 tests. But as Chantel Belafonte explains, the team is also excited about residents. The Kate Mobile Response Unit returned once again to Philadelphia to provide free COVID testing to all Philadelphians. The walk-up event took place outside of State Representative Danilio Burgess's office, located at 635 West Erie Avenue. Latino Connection partnered with the state rep, the Independence Blue Cross Foundation, and Children's Hospital of Philadelphia to test those who believed they were exposed to someone with COVID and educate them on how to stay safe. Jean Kubelet, program manager and lead for the Kate Mobile event, assisted with organizing and registering people for free COVID-19 testing. Kubelet has been to Philly 17 times to test residents. Testing is lacking all over so just the fact that we're in somebody's community being able to test them um, no questions asked is what we really um, wish to measure and goal. Kubelet said symptoms were not a factor in getting tested. Kate's goal was to get 100 people tested. Um, we've had a good flow. Um, we've been here since 1. We started testing at 1 and we're in over at 5. So hopefully we at least get 100 today. Domingo Negron got tested at the Cape Mobile site because he was unsure if he had COVID. Negron said he wears a mask to protect other people. Because you know you can get a spray, a spray the COVID or whatever you have. In order to avoid getting COVID, Cubulet recommends everyone to wear a mask, stay six feet apart when possible, and avoid large gatherings. Dr. Thomas Farley warned viewers during the virtual House Delegation Town Hall meeting that vaccines are limited. There is a very limited number of doses that, uh, of these two vaccines that are being produced uh, on a weekly basis and distributed on a weekly basis through the federal government to states and a few big cities, including Philadelphia. Uh, and we get the same amount on a per capita basis as every other jurisdiction in the country. But that same amount is not nearly enough. Raynette Dolman stood in line with other residents to get tested. COVID hit home for Dolman, who lost a grandmother to the deadly virus. Uh, my grandma just recently died from COVID, so I, yeah, I take it very more serious than anything now. At first, I didn't take it serious, but I see you know, losing the level, it makes me take it more serious. Although Dolman is getting tested, Dolman is not comfortable taking the vaccine. According to a Pew Research, 40% of people say that they will not get the vaccine. Half of that number say they will get the vaccine after majority of people get vaccinated and more information is released about the vaccine. Keep yourself informed. Um, it's okay to have doubts. I think that's just part of being human. Um, but the best way to know is to inform yourself. Um, it's, it's coming along. I think the best way for you to kind of feel secure about the vaccine is to inform yourself. The Kate Mobile Response Unit has tested over 300 Philadelphia residents for free, providing security for many Philadelphians on their status of COVID-19. Those who received free testing will receive the results in two to five days. Anyone interested in receiving services should visit www.katemobileunit.com for more information about upcoming events. I'm Chantal Bolafonte reporting for Philly Cam Voices. 
The Mai Tai restaurant on South Philly is on South Street is finally back open after the city of Philadelphia eases COVID-19 restrictions on indoor dining. Restaurants can only operate with 50% capacity. Masks must still be worn. Social distancing must be maintained. And there can only be four people at a table from the same household. DeRay Edmonds talked to the owner about the road to recovery. We have the opportunity to open for the indoor dining. We have to be strict about the mask, okay, face shield, gel, alcohol, and I have an extra item. If you look for there, we have the ozone generator that we use and that would help, you know, cleanse the whole area rather than rub on, wipe on, or spray it on because this uh, also, the generator will go into all the nook and candies of this whole room. We've been coping okay. Um, through the generosity of our customers, we are able to survive. Will I say amazing? No. But the fact that we are still open and still surviving. We're very, very grateful. We've been here for over 30 years. For me, 30 years seem to go by ever so quick. This brick wall we have for years and years, I love it. Every time I look at it, I say, okay, this is the path that we can look at. And then when you turn to the other three sides of the room, you can look outside and you can see the chain from year to year to year. And now, 30 some years later, I'm still here with my tie and with most of our loyal neighbor customer. When orders come in, yeah, I get tired, but when they come out, we see customers, they're eating, they enjoy our food, that's all I need. I'm thankful to all the Philadelphians and I would like to thank all the uh, staff that I love so dear and I think of them as my own family all the time. Well, I think I do have quite a bit of fire inside of me and I'm uh, ready to cook some more. Thank you. 2020 is over, but despite a new administration, the new year has gotten off to a rocky start. To talk about the new year, the challenges, we are going to have Dennis Link and we will be joined later by Vincent Thompson. Dennis Link is the voice reporter of WPPM Radio, host and Vincent will be joining us and he's the principal of Thompson Media Man Communications. And he says that his opinions and his expressions are his own and has no connection with any other party. So let's get started. Are you ready? I'm all set, Amanda. Thanks for having us on the program. It is a pleasure. So what do you think about the new administration and what it means for the country? Well, I think the, the new administration provides a break from, you know, all the, the, the Trump era, uh, you know, the chaos that was going hey, on. Hey, how you doing, Vincent? I'm good. Welcome. I'm good. I'm good. Hey, everybody. All right. Yeah. Hey. So uh, uh, Amanda had, had asked us, um, you know, what does a new administration uh, in Washington mean for for America? And uh, I guess I was just getting the ball rolling. Uh, you know, I guess the, the, the thing I would say overall in general, Vincent, is just I think it establishes a sense of normalcy, um, you know, contrary to the fact that there was, you know, through the Trump era, a lot of a lot of chaos, a lot of invective. And it's not going to go away anytime soon, at least the invective part. But I think at least um, given Joe Biden's history of being uh, a longtime senator and somebody who has a track record 
of being able to uh, at least talk to people on the other side of the aisle, I, I think that that that's probably those that characteristic will be a good start in terms of trying to tackle a lot of the big issues. Um, you know, number one should be relief. You know, getting this relief bill passed and having something satisfactory that's going to help all Americans. Uh, having measures in place to help the economy, um, and and also how the uh, the COVID vaccine is going to be administered because already you know uh, things have gotten off to a, a slow start. And uh, the the administration of the vaccine and getting mm -hmm. it to people, um, you know, not only a lot of people, but in an equitable fashion, um, will be really key to the economic part of it. You know that that, that I discussed, and and um, you know, and then there's a whole bunch of you know foreign policy issues. Uh, you know, trying to rebuild relationships, you know, between the United States and um, and, and 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 other nations that I guess felt alienated by the previous administration. So. I, those in general, those are some of the things um, that that I think uh, are at the forefront that that Joe Biden and his administration are gonna have to tackle. Um, and and then there's going to be, you know, the, the first order of business, unfortunately, before all those things that I mentioned may actually be an impeachment trial in the Senate, which is going to delay all of that. So um, that's that's just where I am, Amanda, in terms of, you know, uh, in general, what I think it means for a new administration coming in and, and you know what some of the challenges will be. Amanda, as we say in politics, I agree with my esteemed colleague out in the uh, other part of the city. I mean, listen, it, it the Joe Biden administration has one big priority and that is to end the pandemic, right? We should be, we should understand that we'll probably never get rid of COVID-19 as a society, just like we don't get rid of the flu and we don't get rid of other things, but we have to be able to 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 get the inoculations where 70 to 80 percent of America is is vaccinated so that we can have some kind of normal life. And I put normal in air quotes because we don't know what normal is ever going to be again. So the Biden administration has a tough task. There is a lot of people who just aren't going to take the vaccine. Right. There are people in the city of Philadelphia who aren't going to take the vaccine as people in other parts of the country aren't going to take the vaccine. So I think he has to deal with that and all the other economic fallout that's impacted that. Because remember, that economic fallout just isn't happening on the federal level. It's happening on the state level and it's happening on the city level. So as a person who's getting ready for the mayor to reveal his budget address for fiscal year 2021 in April, expect a lot of belt tightening in the city government, right? Because when hotels can't operate and tourism can't come, we lose a lot of revenue. So it's going to be tight. So if people think that we're going to have a, a lot of money in the city budget. Don't expect that. Okay. All right. So imagine you guys, you know, you walk into a buffet and you go, you have all these choices, right? But you have to pick something to put on your plate first and then second. So this is something that the Biden administration had to deal with. So let's talk about what should that plate look like, the things that they should be dealing with first. All right, no, the, the only thing on their plate is coronavirus. That's it. Like, if you don't deal with the coronavirus, you can't do anywhere. It's like the kid that doesn't want to eat Brussels sprouts. Well, the coronavirus is the Brussels sprout. You have to eat that before you can do anything else moving forward. So like I said, it, it's like Dennis says, even if you want to get an economic recovery, that economic recovery is helping with the impact of the country from the coronavirus. You know, if you get more vaccinations out to people, that's dealing with the impact of the coronavirus. So the coronavirus kind of impacts everything. But one of the problems with the new administration is, and Dennis will tell you, is the Biden administration doesn't know what's going to happen, right? Like as we speak right now, there's a coup in Myanmar. Right. When when he when Biden came into office and Kamala Harris came into office, they didn't expect there would be a coup in Myanmar. So you never know what foreign events will impact the president or domestic events will impact the president. But I can see from at least the next year, year and a half, everything's going to spin around coronavirus. Yeah. And, and uh, Amanda, this is where we are, basically. You know, so so Joe Biden said early on, you know, after his inauguration that he set a goal of 100 mil million shots in the first 100 days of his administration. So, so far, there's about, I don't know, roughly 17 to 18 million doses that have been administered. 
Um, and, and but only two million of those people have gotten their second shot. And then there's some 20 million more doses that have been distributed, but they haven't yet been administered. And and the, the problem is that, you know, it's good to have a, a at a federal level, you know, a, a goal or a plan. But then, you know, the federal uh, you know officials can't necessarily carry it out at the local level. And, and that's where where the issue is, is is trying to get um, those doses you know, in the hands of, of, you know, the local officials and then to have a coordinated plan to, to in, a, in a, a, a clear, efficient and equitable way, get that out to the public. Right. Now, one of the things that we've dealt with very recently in the news is, uh, you know, Phillies fighting COVID and, and, and that organization, um, you, you know, which was contracted with the city of Philadelphia to, to do this giant rollout uh, at the, the convention center, to, to try to make this uh, an easier, quicker process. But, um, you know, as the headlines have been telling us, that has not gone well at all. Um, and, and that's, again, it's something that's sort of out of Joe Biden's hands, but it's something that, you know, localities all across the country may have to deal with similar type things. Um, you know, where, uh, you know, in, in, in the, the, this case with, with uh, you know, Philly fighting COVID, um, you know, they, they said they were going to do one thing, um, but then they started doing another. So they switched from nonprofit status to for profit. Um, and then they updated their privacy policy midstream to sell information, um, you know, through its, its vaccine pre registration website. So these are things that, um, you know, and, and again, I, it, I, I believe that the, the city is guilty of poor oversight, but it's also the, the first time around for Philadelphia and all these other localities in ter terms of doing this. So I think that, you know, the, the, the federal uh, effort is one thing, you know, being able to carry it out locally is another. And, and I think that's going to be, you know, one of the challenges going forward, because again, we're talking about a hundred million shots. We're only at about 17, 18 million now. Uh, we got a long way to go. Let's tell you what's going to make it difficult here in the city of Philadelphia, right? Everybody wants a shot, right? Everybody's afraid of, of the coronavirus. They don't know. They, they, you know, people want a shot. Here's the difficulty in Philadelphia. And I'm going to keep this real for people. The vaccines, you have to take two shots, right? Philadelphia gets 20,000 vials a week. You have to inoculate 1.5 million people. It's simple math. If you only get 20,000 a week and you got to give 1.5 million people two shots, that's 3 million vaccinations. People are going to have to wait. A good example. I work in the industry. I work in government. I'm not even on the list to get one because I'm so far down the list because there are other people that need the shots. So I only ask people this. I understand the frustration. I get it. But you're just going to have to wait because of math. Okay. Now, what happened with Philly fights COVID was wrong for the, for the health department. It's a black eye on the health department because you were basically trusting 22, 23 year old kids to give out vaccines. I don't know who was thinking about that. I don't know who made that mistake, but a deputy commissioner has been let go. The Philly COVID, Philly fighting COVID did give out 7,000 vaccines. But the question is, why were they given 7,000 vaccines and the Black Doctors COVID Consortium, which is run by a board certified pediatrician, only got 2,500? And there are other hospitals that have gotten it and haven't gotten it to the people. So really, here's what's happened. Hospitals are giving it to their employees, right? City is giving it, the city vaccine fiends are giving to people who are like healthcare workers, right? Philly fighting COVID gave it to general public, only 7,000. And then the black doctors have only given it to the general public. So there needs to be more coordination. If I was the health department, this is what I would do. I would take over the demand of all health shots because you're going to be darned if you do and darned if you don't. So you might as well take over the control. You might as well network with organizations that you know are legitimate. The Black Doctors Association, the Latino Doctors Association, 
the Asian Doctors Association and target those communities. You know, let the black doctors go to other parts of the city, that the Latino doctors be in parts of the city where Latinos are heavily at, because you want to have a trusted messenger giving you this information. And since we are a city of eds and meds, you've got hospitals all over. You then assign it to hospitals. And if, if, if they can do mass vaccinations at Dodger Stadium, I know we can do it in Philly. So I just think it needs to be more streamlined, more easier for people. But I'm going to warn people out there, and you're going to get mad at me. Until the city gets more than 20,000 vials, we're not going to inoculate everybody quickly. I know in some ways it's becoming a Game of Thrones where people are just trying to get the vaccine and go in line. But just masks can't get you the vaccine. So I need everybody to simmer down, relax, wear a mask, wear a stay mask. outside, wear two masks, and they'll get to you eventually. But it's just simple masks that, you know, we can't. Like people are saying, well, Pittsburgh is able to do it. Pittsburgh has 300,000 people. We've got 1.5. So even if they get 20,000 vials in Pittsburgh, within a certain amount of time, they can get to everybody. But if you get 20,000 in Philly, you're not going to get to everybody in a week. It's just not going to happen. So I urge people just to calm down. We're going to figure this out. All right. Let's get to a little heavier question. Going to start with you, Dennis. Should Congress pursue the impeachment of Donald Trump? Okay, so um, I definitely know people's opinion, uh, the majority of people's opinion in Philadelphia. Uh, but what I'm going to say is based upon, you know, my, and again, I'm not a constitutional lawyer, but this is based upon my reading of the Constitution. And, and to me, I don't see that there is a, a constitutional authority to impeach a private citizen, a former president. In the Constitution, it specifically talks about President of the United States in any context of impeachment. So I'm not certain that it's even a, a constitutional um, ability of Congress to go after Donald Trump now at this point. Um, and and, and here, here's the other issue that I have. It's not, not just about whether or not they can, but it's also about whether or not they should. So when we started our discussion, Amanda, I, I, I talked about how, uh, you know, with, with impeachment, constitutionally, when there is a, articles of impeachment up and, and there is a, uh, a Senate trial, constitutionally, that must take precedence right. over any other issue. So, so our sitting Congress people have no choice but to address that once it's introduced. Right. So, so that's the other problem. Not can they do it, but should they do it? Because... Right. In terms of coronavirus, in terms of the economy, in terms of relief, there are so many other priorities that the United States has that I just think that that the, the impeachment at this point is a distraction. And, and, and the last thing I'll say on this is, is, is the fact that Joe Biden, in his inauguration address, the theme was uh, America and unity. And he talked about trying to you know, bring the country together after a very fractured, rancorous last four years. I believe it would be a horrible way to get the thing started in the Biden administration to try to alienate about 74 million people who voted for Donald Trump. And whether that was a good move or not, whether you like them or not, whether you think you know, that you can, you can think of all kinds of things about their motivations in voting for Donald Trump. But the bottom line is if you're looking for unity, if you're looking to, to create you know, some sort of bipartisan movement towards common goals that, that affect us all, like the, the, the virus and the economy and so forth, that's a really bad way to start is to go after Donald Trump when he's actually been removed by the voters at this point. I cannot let, I cannot let an insurrection go by. And you know what, you know, Dennis, we know the constitution. You know what? There's a lot of things when the Constitution was written back in the 1700s that they never anticipated. So let's just run it. Let's run the impeachment and see how it goes. If people want to argue against it, let them do it. But I can't let a president who everyone agrees his language and his words led to an insurrection of the U.S. Capitol 
that had people hurt, that had police officers hurt, and could have had members of Congress held as hostage. I can't, I, somebody got to pay. Somebody, there, there needs to be a trial in some way, shape, or form. Now, I'm not saying that he's going to be impeached, but I think that you cannot let that stand because I'm going to play devil's advocate. If it happened in the last days of Barack Obama and Republicans were controlling the Senate, you best believe that there would have been an impeachment trial. And you and I both know, Dennis, and this is not negative, if you lead the Senate, the Senate could have had this impeachment trial before Donald Trump even left office, right? Because they got a U.S. Supreme Court justice sworn in eight days after she was appointed. Eight days, which is unheard of. But they didn't have enough time to do an impeachment trial. This has to happen. I don't think Biden wants it to happen. I think out of all the things that Biden wanted to do in his first 100 days, I don't think he wanted an impeachment. But you can't just let that stand. And there's going to be a local flavor to this too, Amanda. Bruce Castor, the former uh, district attorney of Montgomery County, is going to be the lead attorney for the president in fighting the uh, impeachment. So I, I think there's a good likelihood that enough Republicans will stay with the president that he won't be impeached. But I don't think you can let something like this go. You got to deal with the impeachment. Gotcha. Yeah. And Vince, the way I see it is the Department of Justice in, in its ex, you know it role under the executive branch, they can pursue an investigation and they can press charges. And there's also a court system. I mean, you know, Donald Trump can be criminally charged. So to me, I, I just what I'm concerned about is that, that no matter how much people hate Donald Trump, OK, mm-hmm. impeachment can't just be used contrary to the, you know, to the Constitution as as a, a weapon, uh, you know, against uh, who, somebody who is effectively now a private citizen. You know, so I, I, I think that there are other ways that mm-hmm. Donald Trump can be held accountable. Um, and, and that's the, the path I'd rather see it take. And, and again, you know, I think that it, there, there's other factors here that, um, you know, we need to move forward with the, the new administration's agenda. And I think whatever bridges can be built with, uh, you know, c- Congress people on the other side um, and, and with, you know, the, the Trump supporters out there, I, I think it needs to happen. And I just I, I don't know that taking this particular tack is is going to be the, the the best way to do it particularly when you look at the fact that as a practical matter you need two-thirds that's to true get in the senate so that would mean with the, when there's 50 republican senators um you know you, 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 well there's there's 50 democratic senators and there's 50 republican senators you would need 17 republicans right. To, to turn around and convict Donald Trump. And, and that's not going to happen. We can agree. It's not going to happen. And, and they, right. in fact, they, they voted on a, resol- a resolution recently uh, where they tried to dismiss this whole matter. Right. And 45 Republicans voted to uh, you know dismiss the matter. Now, that meant that five did say, no, no, we do need to, to have an impeachment uh, you know uh, trial in the Senate. But still, when you're looking at votes, we're not even close to the votes. All so right, to then if you don't have to I'm just not sure if that's, you know, really going to benefit the country overall. All right, Dennis and Vincent, I thank you guys for this healthy conversation because it's always good to just talk it out and just see the different views because sometimes you're like, you know what? I see your point of view. So I thank you guys for taking time out to sit and talk with us today with having a healthy conversation. And we thank you guys for watching um another episode of philly cam voices you can also watch us on youtube and roku and follow us on facebook and instagram and we'll see you guys next time